Step aside, MK Ultra. Food, the ultimate weapon of mind control. The following is an article I wrote in preparation for a roundtable discussion on uh, the Agora podcast titled Food is a Weapon. It ended up being uh, way more comprehensive than I expected, and uh, so I feel this audio supplement will be especially important. Uh, keep a lookout for that roundtable discussion uh, as, as well. It was just uh, an amazing, amazing discussion. Lots of uh, lots of great people. Uh, I'll release it onto the feed uh, in the uh, coming days, uh, or you can find it on the Agora podcast beforehand. But uh, yeah, you can find ways to support the Pazian Department of Health and Wellness uh, in the show notes. Uh, save $500 on an amazing AquaCare machine uh, by using coupon code VANU uh, at George Wiseman's site, uh, eagle-research.com. And uh, you can also become a stakeholder if you'd like to join the Second Realm in a more overarching capacity. And uh, we'll just mention here, you know, off the cuff that we do have Vani Fest coming up in just a couple weeks. So uh, if you uh, are uh, looking for uh, an escape to the Second Realm, uh, then uh, check out passingcom forward slash VaniFest. Get vetted if you haven't already. And uh, yeah, we'd uh, love to have you out here. So uh, yeah, check out the show notes or uh, just visit passingcom for more information. Uh, please enjoy. And always remember, Vani was yours for the making and the second realm is yours for the building. Cheers. Step aside, MK Ultra. Food the ultimate weapon of mind control. Most people today are familiar with MKUltra, the most well-known program highlighting the government's research into uh, using drugs and other forms of torture and abuse as a means of controlling and exploiting the human mind. The late Milton William Cooper talked about the open-air mind control laboratory already long in place in the 1990s, consisting of a seemingly large apparatus across various industries, technology, entertainment, pharmaceutical, uh, and political to name some. And while many of these areas are ingrained daily into the lives of most, and undoubtedly carry with them their own consequences, nothing is more pervasive and worthy of threat modeling than what gains access, uh, than what gains direct access into our bodies on many, many occasions throughout the day. That is, the food that we eat, the drinks that we drink. Believe it or not, the spiritual war really begins in the guts, and our microbiome is the first line of defense. It determines the physical nutrition we will assimilate, the balance of microorganisms found therein, and in regards to mind control, our gut microbiome has a literal impact on what happens to serotonin, dopamine, and other important hormones related to happiness, energy, and reproduction. Yes, again, the aforementioned industries are all worthy of attention. But in this realm of free will, despite what Babylon's minions might tell you, we are in control of our health and what takes place within our body. And it starts with what we put into our mouths. Step aside, MK Ultra. Your mind bomb patsies are essentially the whole population now. Food, the ultimate weapon of mind control. Number one, a chronically poisoned, nutrient-depleted food supply. The abundance of toxins in the world today is staggering, and yet only increasing. If you're like me, every trip to the grocery store is a speed shop, as there are only about a half dozen non-toxic items found on the foodstuff shelves. Even seemingly good items will likely have some issue, such as natural flavors, which means that the base is some natural ingredient, but it can be mixed with any of some few thousand synthetic chemicals, rancid seed oils, see below, uh, agrochemical exposure, despite being labeled organic, mold, um, artificial sweeteners, and even just outright legally sanctioned fraud. One example that comes to mind for the latter involves Kerrygold. They recently won a civil suit where it was found that they were feeding their quote-unquote grass-fed cows GMO corn and soy, setting the legal precedent that food manufacturers can label their foods grass-fed, yet feed the animals GMO crops. Wonderful. Along a similar line of thought, just because a type of food is toxic here in the West doesn't mean that food is that, that, that food is inherently toxic. It could just mean that the way it's done here is absolutely wrong and backwards, and if done traditionally, could add benefits. Many of my readers will be surprised to hear this, but I guess more so now. Uh, this raw, this raw organ-eating carnivore will eat, uh, will eat white, long-grain Indian rice that requires soaking for roughly 30 minutes before cooking, uh, reducing the phytic acid, uh, anti-nutrient component of the grains, uh, making it easier to digest too. But uh, yeah, it's amazing. My previous experiences would dictate bloating, a large blood sugar spike, and maybe a little caloric energy. Um, but that's it. Not one is prepared the way our ancestors uh, ancestors did, though, and uh, the glucose spike cushioned by an abundance of uh, proteins, uh, animal fats, and carb-eating bacteria. Similarly, bread used to be made with close-to-nature ancient grains and commonly involved uh, live kefir cultures. Just a thought. Maybe we weren't really designed to digest uh, you know, all this bread and grains or carbohydrates. 
Maybe the microorganisms that used to be present did that, uh, did that for us. Trust me when I say I could go on forever. But for now, always buy organic when shopping in a grocery store. Uh, but that alone does not mean what you're getting is free of the toxins they promise. The only safe bet is to know your food producer and or to become your own. Number two, the gut microbiome, hijacking of hormones, and a cascade of imbalance. To some, the topic of the gut microbiome may be some new fad or health hype, evoking uncomfortable images of fecal transplants as ripped on by South Park. But on a serious note, the gut microbiome really is the first step to health. Living on a homestead, I know firsthand that if you leave food around, some animal, insect, or fungus will pop up to eat it. The same happens within our guts, whose competition can change every few days based upon what we eat or don't eat. Different types of foods, say animal fats and proteins, uh, versus sugar require different microorganisms and even methods of digestion. And in nature, fungus and mushrooms are being used to clean up the environment. Uh, it's pretty amazing. The mushroom will consume the poison and yet still be edible and nutritious afterwards. In our bodies, the same thing happens. One example is the yeast strain Candida. Uh, a natural health practitioner friend, Daryl Becker, recounted a story on a podcast. Uh, he had a patient with a Candida overgrowth. Uh, they took care of the Candida strain, but the patient's symptoms got worse in the interim. It turns out the candida was there to remove the mercury in her system. And when the candida was removed, the mercury was entering general circulation, uh, hence the symptoms. Speaking more generally, thanks to the consumption of abject poisons and lectin-rich foods and many other things, uh, many today are suffering with something called a leaky gut. Uh, these poisons can, over time, uh, wear down the gut lining, meaning undigested food and substances enter other parts of the body. Uh, there's a really terrific uh, academic paper titled All Disease Begins in the Leaky Gut uh, that I would highly recommend checking out. It's linked in, uh, linked in the article. The scientists and researchers of this study quite definitively determine that leaky gut is really the cause of all so-called disease. Chronic inflammatory disease, autoimmune disease, allergies, etc. When learning that 70 to 80% of your immune cells are found in your guts, these imbalances begin to make sense. Pair that with the fact that if someone has this cascade of events happening in their stomach cavity, they're not going to be assimilating nutrition properly. Taking in less while needing more energy to handle the oxidative stress, detoxification of yours and your microorganisms friend, uh, microorganism friends' waste, to switch on the body's regeneration capabilities, uh, etc. Hence the words chronic and degenerative. Thankfully, though, the gut can be one of the easier root causes to rebalance, uh, so long as you notice the issues in digestion and such early. As mentioned above, the microorganism composition can change quickly over the course of a few days, and uh, even more serious bacterial imbalances like H. pylori can still be just a few weeks away from resolution. Please note, the solution is not to use some antibiotic to wipe out whatever strain might be out of balance. The, an the answer is to fix the underlying condition that brought about the imbalance. Uh, otherwise, even if you kill off the microbial population, uh, it will likely make its reappearance again, and maybe even more viciously next time. A couple other items are worth considering in this area. The potential hijacking of hormones and food for mental health. Foods that I eat a ton of are raw and fermented dairy. These foods contain the amino acid tryptophan, which can literally boost your mood. Uh, animal testicles, I usually consume lamb or goat, uh, also contain bioavailable testosterone, cofactors, and since it's an organ, it's chock full of other nutrition too. These are also full of B vitamins, which we especially need a lot of today. Processed foods, and really anything else recommended by Babylon, are not only devoid of all of these living enzymes and hormones, but they are devoid of any semblance of life. All that remains is a marginal amount of caloric energy and a bunch of toxic garbage to be dealt with by the body. Most who have overwhelmed their detoxification capacities will likely store the toxins and fats uh, to keep them out of general circulation and away from important organs. Number three, the demonization of cholesterol and saturated fats and promotion of rancid omega-6 seed oils. Many professionals will absolutely smite an anecdotal example that hasn't undergone rigorous double-blind experimentation, but thanks, thankfully it's been years since I've given a shit about what some quack thinks. Fun fact, the word quack was a de uh, denigrating verbiage used to describe doctors who use mercury, quacksilver, as a means of treatment. As a demonstration of everything being inver inverted in this realm, this was actually one of the selling points for Babylon Pharmaceuticals when it came to the convid, convid quaxine that no adjuvant, i.e. mercury, was used, meaning they literally just stopped being quacks. After years of mostly not giving a shit about myself and lacking energy to pull myself out of the lifelong slump I was in, I made a quite random dietary change. As a so-called type 1 diabetic, I ascertained that a low-carb diet would be advantageous for someone with uh, carbohydrate intolerance. 
Soon after, I went carnivore, and before long, adopted a nose-to-tail carnivore lifestyle. I dropped 20 pounds within a month or two, reversed a slew of nutritional deficiencies from eating pounds of brain, liver, and raw dairy each week. Uh, I was getting ripped without working out, had basically unlimited energy, was sleeping eight hours a night effortlessly, and literally every other positive metric you could think of. Though, this was before the time I decided not to give Babylon's demons any more of my blood, and so I wanted to get some basic tests done to see where I was at then, even though it wasn't an actual baseline. As any type 1 diabetic with elevated blood sugars and just (laughs) a long line of imbalances for a decade, my LDL cholesterol was a bit high. But despite every other positive metric, my doctor told me that I was definitely going to die within a couple months, and that I had to go on a statin now. At that time, I was like many others. I told her to write the prescription and was going to start it, but thankfully, Dr. Richard Bernstein, a 70-something-year-old, 50-plus-year, quite radical type 1 diabetic, uh, intervened. It went like this. I left the doctor's office feeling conflicted as fuck, and uh, quick found Dr. Bernstein's video on the subject. Therein, he basically called the doctors criminals for starting children or young adults on this drug so indiscriminately. I was shocked. Most every day, I thank Creator for that intervention, as I now know the detriments associated with all Babylon pharmaceuticals, uh, especially statins. A quick lesson on cholesterol metabolism is in order. When someone goes to a doctor for a checkup, they usually get a basic metabolic panel done, which contains the readings of high-density and low-density lipoproteins, as as well as triglycerides, uh, which are excess sugar um, that has yet to be utilized by the body. Another reading is sometimes there, uh, namely LDL-C, which is an actual measurement of how much, how much cholesterol is on the LDL raft. If this individual's results show that they have, say, low HDL, high LDL, and high triglycerides, it's almost guaranteed they'll get a script for a statin without hesitation, despite an abundance of evidence existing showing that populations with the highest levels of LDL actually live the longest, and that most patients cardiologists see for heart attacks, strokes, etc., almost always have super low LDL cholesterol levels. And in the keto carnivore realms, this is a big topic. Many find that when they adopt these ways of eating, they see their LDL and HDL increase and triglycerides decrease. Again, every other metric shows benefits. These individuals have never felt or looked better, and yet their quote-unquote bad cholesterol increased. No, it didn't. These individuals are giving their body an abundance of materials to rebuild with, and those materials need to be transported to different parts of the body, hence the LDL raft deployed by the liver. I could spend time presenting and refuting the Babylon pharmaceutical model further, but that has been done at length already. So I'll recommend the work of Dave Feldman, uh, his interviews, presentations, and research in the book, Fat and Cholesterol Don't Cause Heart Disease and Statins Are Not the Answer. Note, Dave Feldman does a lot of fascinating radical cholesterol experimentation. After going low carb, his LDL went above 300. In a subsequent experiment, he ate a diet of processed cheese and white bread over the course of a week, and his LDL plummeted to below 75. So 300 to below 75 within a week. And he looked and felt like absolute shit. He also made me aware of the fact that when you go in for these labs fasted, your body will go into fat burning mode for energy, which also raises LDL, I think, by like 20 or 25%. Seeing the scam yet? When you begin to understand that cholesterol is literally the building block for all of our sex hormones, all of our cells, is necessary for the synthesis of vitamin D3 and other reactions, and much, much more. It becomes clear how when one eats a saturated fat and cholesterol-deficient diet, they make themselves an easy target of mind control. There's also the fact that, as any nose-to-tail carnivore, carnivore will know, the brain consists of primarily those two things, animal fats, around 4,800 uh, milligrams of omega-3 specifically, and a whopping 4,000%, 12,122 milligrams, the recommended daily amount of cholesterol in a four ounce serving. These are foods I would call high meats, as your body will respond positively almost immediately, even more so if you ferment them. I guess just one note on those on the, on, on the brain. Uh, the more raw, the better, but always seek out quality sources. One illuminating excerpt from the aforelinked is the metabolic syndrome caused by high fructose and relatively low fat, low cholesterol diets that will tie multiple sections of this article together. Quote, it is commonly believed that the body can synthesize all the cholesterol and fats that it needs, but this may not be true because the liver becomes overburdened with its many tasks when the diet is so skewed. Cholesterol synthesis in the liver, a complex 25 to 30 step process, may be relatively suppressed when insulin is present, end quote. Are you starting to overstand? Next are rancid omega-6 seed oils, otherwise known as linoleic acid. These are the products of the Industrial Revolution and found their initial fame as lubricants. Then they got the bright idea to start selling them as a cheap alternative to butter, lard, etc. 
Not only do polyunsaturated fats, PUFAs, oxidize far easier and at lower temperatures, but we're only supposed to get so many of them in our diets, with the scale weighed heavily in favor of saturated and monounsaturated fats. These are usually extracted with super high temperatures, making the fats totally rancid, and with chemicals like benzene. They are totally unfit for human consumption, but you'll have a hard time finding anywhere to eat out that, d that doesn't cook in the shit. Better just hope your batch was the first and not the hundredth. One other interesting side benefit. If you peruse the seed oil part of Twitter, you'll find endless anecdotal examples of people who used to sunburn extremely easily, but after cutting out seed oils, sunburn is a thing of the past. This would seem to indicate that rancid seed oils interfere with vitamin D3 metabolism in some way, which would make sense as a fat-soluble vitamin, uh, but even if not that pathway in particular, the results are demonstrable anyway. Glyphosate is one final offender worth discussing in passing that can cause similar chaos throughout the entire body. Thanks to the wonderful work of MIT professor Dr. Stephanie Seneff and her cohorts, we now know that glyphosate is a non-coding analog of the amino acid glycine. The body initially gets confused by the structure of glyphosate and begins to assimilate it as if it was the proper amino acid. So let's say the body had been assimilating these non-coding analogs of glycine in a particular organ, say the pancreas. Within the pancreas, these glycine molecules might be responsible for the production uh, and release of insulin from beta cells. But what if the constituent that is there isn't supposed to be there and actually doesn't function as intended? And what does the body do when it recognizes its mistake of biological mimicry? The body will, quote-unquote, attack itself to try to correct the problem, hence, quote, autoimmune disease. And if you don't happen to have the microorganisms available to consume and break down the waste, maybe due to antibiotics, you can end up with a hanging chronic conflict that will remain unaddressed. Uh, this is my current understanding and experience at least. Um, Dr. Berlando from Alpha Vedic and German New Medicine are a couple really terrific pointers. But the body is never working against you, as the warlike practitioners of allopathy would have you believe. It's always working in concert with you, making whatever biological adaptations necessary to keep you here to uh, fulfill your will, uh, your purpose. Number four, sugar, stress, and stimulants. At some point, we had to get to the section where the vast majority of us happen to be hardcore addicts, sugar and caffeine. What do these two have to do with each other, you might ask? Well, to put it frankly, an overwhelmed adrenal gland is another way to so-called quote-unquote uh, quote unquote, type 2 diabetes. Here's a scenario. You find yourself in the woods and a bear jumps out. Your adrenals dump adrenal, uh, adrenaline and, uh, and probably other stress hormones to put you into fight or flight. Your pancreas dumps insulin to make energy ready, readily available to your cells, and in particular, muscles and bones needed to escape, and then you run, burning up that energy that was made available. Now let's say you're at the office in your servile society job, and your boss or coworker pisses you off. The exact same sequence of events could happen, but you aren't getting rid of that energy, and you aren't using up that adrenaline. That's the first problem. The second problem is that the insulin response is going to cause hunger. It's like the feeling of starving, but without a low blood sugar. And with the continued secretion of this crucial hormone, the body develops what's called insulin resistance, which at its core is what type 2 diabetes is. The further problem is that in the, in the modern servile society, such irritants and frustrations are not only staples, but they're by design. If you're constantly stressed, worried, and fear, and, or any other low vibratory emotions, you're not going to be thriving or living in abundance. You're not going to be in good health. You're not going to have the energy or motivation to do what you need or want to do. In this case, you might develop uh, adrenal insufficiency and burnout. Nerves will be totally shot, and hence every little thing being an irritant. Uh, your body's large reserve of antioxidants, the adrenals, will be exhausted meaning oxidative stress cascades and other imbalances. The adrenals are prioritized creation of stress hormones over sex hormones, meaning problems with energy and chronic fatigue, pregnancy, and fertility arise. Issues with these latter two are ever more common today, and this is a major reason. On a more nefarious note, do you know what oxidized adrenaline is? Go ask the George Bush and Hillary Clinton creatures. They would know. Probably best to avoid. Constantly providing your body with signals of worry, anxiety, and other emotions basically leaves your body in a sympathetic state, unable to regenerate. This isn't the way humans are supposed to live, and like a wild animal in captivity, it's surely showing. Finally, we come to sugar. My forays into health have led me to this conclusion. There is nothing wrong with the consumption of natural carbohydrates and their natural amounts when nature makes them available. But today, even around here, central Illinois, Grocery stores make a lot of tropical fruits and berries available, even in the dead of winter. Speaking in terms of hormones, the body would usually try to put, a few extra, put away a few extra pounds for winter. But what does your body do when those fattening tools are made available all the time, further disconnecting the individual from cycles of nature? This is made worse, even, when those carbohydrates are processed, poisoned, and fortified to proportions antithetical to health and the human body. 
So that's the first thing. Just be cognizant of what would naturally be available where you are and take that into account. And secondly, most of our ancestors were naturally low carb. Consider cutting back on the white stuff. And if you do partake, choose amazing options like raw local honey. There are always solutions. Number five, conclusion, final thoughts, my daily regimen and recommendations. To make this really simple, if you're overweight or chronically poisoning yourself, it's most certainly affecting the way you're thinking and feeling. And in terms of mind control, a sick and tired population is a population that's far easier to control, far easier to manipulate, and far easier to deceive. But the mere amount of poisons and confusion caused by the medical and pharmaceutical industries is another hurdle. Even if you eat a high-quality, no satile carnivore diet, you could still develop liver damage. Uh, for example, if you aren't getting enough magnesium, uh, you could develop vitamin A toxicity from retinol foods, uh, retinol-rich foods like liver, and could potentially develop calcification if sufficient vitamin K2 uh, in the form MK4 isn't present, along with vitamin D3 and calcium. And to make a fine point, you could develop problems if zinc and copper imbalances occur. This all used to be handled by nature, but the environment is so adulterated. Optimal health truly is something that you need to take up for yourself. The simple truth is, escaping the toxins of civilization is largely impossible, but there are many things that we can do as individuals to improve our own internal terrain, as well as the soil and environment in which we grow our foods uh, and our animals' foods. The two most important pieces, pieces of advice I could provide are, one, stop chronically poisoning yourself, and two, fix nutritional deficiencies. If most people did these two things alone, the majority of health problems would disappear. As a shorthand determinant for step one, rather than becoming severely overwhelmed investigating the topic, Ask yourself if this is something that you would have access to without big industry, and furthermore, if your ancestors would have eaten it or had access to it. As for number two, the most common deficiencies are magnesium, vitamin D3, vitamin K2, vitamin C, zinc and copper if on a standard American diet, uh, cholesterol and animal fats, and especially B vitamins. But rather than pop a bunch of pills, uh, I consume all of my vitamins and minerals in liquid or powder form, uh, in which they're the most bio uh, bioavailable. Well, every day isn't exactly the same. Uh, here's my baseline regimen to give me an idea. Uh, fulvic minerals, two or three times a day. Uh, alpha Vedic enzymes, two times a day, with, I guess, obviously with food. Um, carbon-60 black seed oil, usually at least uh, once a day, or when I feel any symptoms at all. I guess it's not necessarily every day, but whenever I feel like it. Um, I take uh, Alpha Vedic monoatomics um, a few times a week, usually now, and uh, relevant cell and tissue salts, according to my astrophysiology. Uh, one note on fulvic minerals, uh, which is something I will certainly, uh, most certainly take, uh, take often for the rest of my life. Uh, for the rundown, check this full guide out, uh, but here's some highlights. What are fulvic minerals? Quote, organic fulvic acids are created by soil-based microorganisms, SBOs, to make minerals and other nutrients assimilable by plants. The SBOs consume decayed prehistoric plant matter and humate deposits and excrete the substance known as fulvic acids, um, fulvic acid or fulvic acids. These are ways in which we can still obtain these trace uh, vitamins and minerals uh, that are totally gone from the topsoil today. Uh, further, is one of the most powerful nat natural free radical scavengers and antioxidants known, complexes and dissolves minerals and trace elements, enhances and transports nutrients, maximizing bioavailability, take with food, catalyzes enzyme reactions, prevents absorption of toxins, pesticides, and even rapidly reduces radioactivity, and much more. These are all liquid supplements, and uh, usually, I'll, I'll, usually I'll add them to tea in the morning with raw milk. But of course, the best way to obtain your nutrition is through real food. But what about the more chronic degenerative diseases? I believe, no, I know that the body is miraculous enough to heal from basically anything other than maybe the most severe cases of brutality and mutilation by allopathy. Some imbalances may just be more difficult than others. That, and while unbelievable recoveries do happen, sometimes a longer journey of health recovery is in the stars. That said, if you're, if you're someone trying to recover from something but don't know where to start, here are some possible ideas. As I mentioned above, candida is extremely common today due both to the presence of high amounts of sugars in the diet and also to the high concentrations of heavy metals in basically everything we come in contact with. If you determine that is the issue you're dealing with, there are protocols out there that you can try that have shown success. I usually point people towards Dr. Bear Lando at Alpha Vedic, uh, Clive DeCarl, and for, a can uh, and for a candida search specifically, um, Frank Tufano, and the Heal Your Gut Guy. Unless someone is anemic or malnourished, intermittent fasting is a really great idea regardless of what you consume the other hours of the day. This would mean only eating between a certain window and consuming only water and tea, uh, water, tea, etc. the rest of the day. Uh, this gives the gut a daily much-needed break. And finally, start drinking the hypernutritious fermented water and milk kefir daily. 
regardless of the issue, but especially if it's gut related, you need to be consuming raw and fermented foods. I mean, our ancestors always had a, you know some sort of fermented or, or fermented foods in their diet. Um, I'm, now I'm a big fan of high quality dairy and uh, have been fermenting a yogurt type snack for a couple of years. Uh, just put raw milk on the counter sometime, cover with a coffee filter and uh, let it ferment for a week or two. Uh, then filter out the liquid whey and uh, put the yogurt looking stuff in the fridge. After it cools, you can add some blueberries, raw honey, cacao, etc., and uh, enjoy. And uh, you can do the same thing with the, the milk kefir, which I'm getting more into. And this is not this is not in the article, but um, yeah, I've been getting more into that, and I'll, I'll talk more about that. But uh, in the interim, to make your own water or milk kefir, you learn more about the extensive benefits. Uh, check out this episode of the Perfected Health Podcast, which is linked in the article. I'm sure there's more I could list, but if you're dealing with something in particular, we always love to help fellow self-liberators who sort of balance in their body via the Pasadena Department of Health and Wellness. Please reach out. In conclusion, as self-liberators, in most every area of our lives, we strive for the most radical forms of, free of freedom and independence, and we need to be doing the same for our health and well-being. While the majority of the servile society is rapidly aging and degenerating, we can adopt the ways of our ancestors and that of nature and outlive the coercers. You've just heard Step Aside MK Ultra, Food, the Ultimate Weapon of Mind Control, uh, originally published at vonnypodcast.com. For more on this liberating freedom strategy, please check out Vonny Podcast, and to join the Second Realm, please visit paznia.com. The Path of a Self-Liberator Introduction from Vonnu, A Strategy for Self-Liberation, Second Edition by Shane Radliff coming September 11th. Back in 2018, when I first published the book you're about to read, I could have never imagined the journey I was about to embark upon. At that time, I had just decided to quit my newly acquired electrician apprenticeship job that I really enjoyed, largely on a whim, and uh, moved to Austin, Texas to live with my former Vonu podcast co-host, Kyle Reardon. So, in the span of a few weeks, the entire trajectory of my life changed. It wasn't planned or even really consciously driven. Uh, it's almost as if my true will was finally going to start making its appearance, uh, whether me or anyone else liked it or not. After a couple of months staying with Kyle in a third-story apartment in uh, North Austin, my situation changed again, and uh, even more radically. He informed me that he and his freemate uh, had found a house and were going to move out ahead of the lease expiring, meaning I would have to take over the exorbitantly priced rent plus utilities on my own uh, if I were to stay there. Needless to say, I sought out other options, uh, rooms to rent on Craigslist, shared housing, cheap options that I could actually afford uh, in the high-priced servile society lifestyle that is Austin. I shared my situation with some friends on social media, and a buddy of mine, Jason Henza, put forth an interesting proposition. At the end of the month, he'd be driving through Austin on his way to Acapulco, Mexico, and that I could ride down and stay with him. He was also generous enough to cover some costs for me since I was in a tumultuous situation financially. Of course, my first thought was, hell no, uh, there's no way that's going to happen. But then again, I really didn't have any other options. Uh, and this is exactly the type of adventure I wanted, uh, exactly the type of, of adventure that I needed. I made the minimal preparations that I could and scrounged up as much fiat currency as was available in the meantime. Thankfully, Austin being the mega city it is, uh, it was pretty easy to find a few temporary jobs in the weekends, uh, major events like the uh, Formula, One, Formula One race, uh, business conferences, uh, etc. In addition to a uh, cheap tent camping spot in Liberty Hill for a few weeks uh, before heading really far south. Leaving some personal non vanu experiences aside, uh, we arrived safely in Acapulco and I got to enjoy a couple months uh, with a somewhat large anarchist community uh, in what truly was a tropical paradise. In terms of bludgies and other state agents, it is undoubtedly better for a Vanu and self-liberator. You're usually just one really cheap bribe away from your freedom, and if you're a gringo, uh, they're even more likely to leave you alone. Uh, it's even a lot easier to acquire legal, authentic Mexican identification too, uh, whether it's a driver's license, registration, etc., uh, enabling prospects for a simplified second identity. But in terms of private coercion, it really is a dangerous place. Though, worth noting, this private violence is still essentially, essentially state-caused, uh, a result of the war on drugs. Don't forget about the USSA government literally shipping weapons south of the border too. My time in Acapulco ended in December 2018, uh, but I'd planned on returning for the Acapulco conference uh, that February. About a week after the conference was set to begin, John Galton was killed, and uh, Henza was shot uh, multiple times at John and Lily's house high up on the mountain, a place I spent a lot of time at, and uh, likely would have been at, if I was still in Mexico with Henza. I'm extremely thankful Henza and Lily are still here with us to share their powerful stories, and uh, may John rest in peace. Uh, he was truly a dedicated freedom pioneer. 
After John's death, I settled back in on what, what is uh, now my homestead in southern Illinois, uh, working at the family distillery, podcasting, and uh, largely just spending time decompressing alone in the wilderness. Uh, this is what I consider the official start uh, to my liberty lifestyle, a lifestyle wherein my time is my own and I'm free to follow my passions. I made some critical lifestyle changes such as quitting alcohol and adopting a new, much healthier way of eating and uh, gained a whole new take on life. Uh, the brain fog was entirely gone. I felt amazing and I discovered my newfound front-running passion, uh, learning about health, the miraculous human body, and investigating health modalities to assist individuals in restoring balance in their bodies, uh, that is, uh, reversing so-called disease. But of course, as per the connected nature of this realm, this rabbit hole of health led to the topics of breakthrough free energy, uh, the Pasadena Department of Health and Wellness, uh, which now has an authentic Rife machine, uh, one of George Wiseman's aqua care machines, and uh, other amazing supplements and tools. And in September 2020, uh, the Free Republic of Pasadena was created, a decentralized network of second realms, our own parallel society. My wonderful free wife and I are nearing food self-sufficiency. Our flock currently including a dozen, lam dozen or so lambs, a few goats, uh, 30 or 40 birds, chickens, ducks, and turkeys, a uh, half dozen rabbits, a few flourishing gardens, and uh, yearly gatherings of liberation uh, for vetted, traveling, uh, van nomads, and venuans. It's been a hell of a handful of years, but I've accomplished the major objective I set out to achieve uh, when I first started digging into solutions way back in 2015. That is, uh, get out of the 9 to 5 rat race jobs that were literally killing me. Of course, I've got much bigger dreams, uh, living on a sailboat, the eventual acquisition of a decommissioned aircraft carrier for second round purposes, a uh, complete spagyrics, alchemy laboratory, etc. But I'm eternally grateful to be where I am and for all those who have played a part. With the recent release of the audiobook, I've decided to release the second edition uh, with the entirety of the main content remaining the same. I've added this introduction and an additional chapter at the end with more information since my experiences are so much greater now. Doing it in this manner means that the audiobook can remain as is, and this uh, additional material tacked on later. Big thanks to Phoenix Aurora and Matthew Workman for their efforts on this. I'll leave it there for now, and let the 2018 version of myself walk you through the most liberating freedom strategy I've ever come across. I wish you the best in your pursuit of freedom, and please do reach out if there's any way I can be of service. Always remember, Bonnie was yours for the making, and the second realm is yours for the building. Cheers from the Free Republic. Shane, Ray 2 August 2022, The Vanu Podcast. The second edition of Shane Radliff's Vanu, A Strategy for Self-Liberation, releases via Liberty under a TAP publication September 11th. Get the updated, updated book on Vanu, and begin, or continue, your journey of liberation today. Pre-order now, libertyunderattack.com forward slash VONU book 2. Again libertyunderattack.com forward slash VONU book 2. And always remember, Vanu is yours for the making. Cheers from the Free Republic of Pasnia.